On the back of the success of the first series in France, the TV station ORTF brought in a young marketing man called Jean-Michel Biard to try and drum up interest in merchandise for the series. It proved a very easy job. A week after I came to the French television, you know, I had already on my, I already 20 inquiries. I didn't know what, what was, what all this, you know, all these people writing to make toys and books and, and apparel and whatever. And, so, hey, and after one month, it was already something like 10 contracts signed. ORTF realized the series could be sold abroad with each country dubbing the puppets in their own language. To this end, they approached the biggest TV station in Europe. So the head of the uh, children's program of the French television contacted the, uh, this person in the UK, Miss Peggy Miller, and said that, why don't you buy that? And they, they viewed, and the reply was, no, no, we, we think it's too complicated for dubbing. We're not going to do it. Uh, thank you very much. Very polite. A few months or after, she changed her mind, but it was the first reaction. Stand by the run time. Nine, eight, seven. In 1964, the BBC Children's Department was about to enter a golden age. Here's a house. Here's a door. Jack and all, eh? Jack and all. These new programs were the work of the new head of children's programming, Doreen Stevens and her team, one of whom was Joy Whitby. I was at the beginning of the children's television uh, as it became after one sort of era ended and another began, mainly with the beginning of BBC Two. I joined at that time, and that was a great start um, in many directions, but in fact, uh, the very first program on it was a children's program called Play School, which I started. Hello. Hello. Let's have Having a established time. innovative live programs like Jack and Ori and Play School, Joy and Doreen were open to more new ideas. When La Manage Enchanté was again offered to the BBC, they saw its appeal as a new kind of puppet series. It had the essential ingredients, I suppose, of a boy and a girl, and a dog, and something magic that went zing, and uh, a magic garden. Those are, those are very classic magic ingredients that appeal to people at all ages, really. And I think that's what charmed visually, because also it had a very new look. At this point, puppets had been animated by either strings or hands in gloves. Stop frame animation took away all visible means of support, allowing the viewer to believe just that little bit more. But Joy still had to overcome the problem of how to turn a noisy French soundtrack into one more suited to British sensibilities. Fortunately, Joy was working with a young actor and presenter who she thought might be perfect for the job. I'd been working with and was very friendly with Eric Thompson and his wife, Phila de Law, and um, I had a great admiration for uh, Eric's intelligence and his um, charm. Eric was a theatre actor and director whose mellifluous voice and apparent lack of self-consciousness made him a perfect children's presenter. A little pet. Now, first of all, I shall need a piece of string, like that, and a knitting needle. Eric was given a few French versions of the program and asked to see what he could do with them. Well, Thompson, I never called him Eric, by the way, because I think that is a deplorable name. Of course, Thompson couldn't, couldn't speak French, was a typical Englishman thought the French were frightful. <laughs> it was a joke, really. He wouldn't take me to a French restaurant. And he didn't um, try to translate it. He worked from the pictures and made up his own stories. So he holed himself up in this tiny cottage in Scotland and wrote this very calm, very straight kind of... Um, 
I don't know how to say it, but a sort of, mm, there were no voices to it, really. With all, you know, he said, Dougal said, he, and he said to me, are there too many of that, of that? I said, no, I think that's the right. It's rather lovely. It's like being read to when you're a child. So he sat with it and sent it to Joy Whitby, who was uh, the woman who said, yeah, I'd go for that. This is Mr. Rusty. He used to be a happy man, but now he's sad. There's no magic in life anymore, he said. You see, once upon a time, when he played his barrel organ with the birds on top, all the children used to come and ride on his roundabout. But now they didn't come anymore. No magic, said Mr. Rusty to the horse. Very likely, said the horse, who was secretly quite pleased with the rest he was having. Eric Thompson got the job. His calm, amusing style of narration seemed to work perfectly. He sat at a really funny old machine. Um, it was quite solid, like that in his study, with two big reel-to-reel -reel, um, film spools on it. And it was quite basic mechanics. It just was forward stop, back stop. And he'd sit there with his A4 pad, and he'd watch the screen, which was in the middle of these two spools. And um, he'd, he'd write the story, and occasionally I'd be a, a, a little assistant, and I'd he'd go forward, and I'd go, and he'd go, stop, and I'd go, and he'd go back. And I'd take that very seriously for about five minutes. <laughs> and he'd wind it back and forth with his feet while he wrote. And on many occasions, the, the picture was so small, he didn't know what the prop was that was delivered to Dougal's house or anything. So he'd get it severely wrong. Quite funny. Voyons un peu pour le père pivoine. Et oui, c'est bien pour moi. Voyons, oh tiens, mais il y a quelque chose écrit derrière. Cher père pivoine. The writing was very bad, but it was definitely addressed to Mr. Rusty. And there's only one thing to do with a parcel that's addressed to you, and that is open it. Carefully, because you never know what might be inside. Do you? 